Thank you very much, Hugo, and thanks to Talit and the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Edinburgh for hosting this. Uh, it's like a second poem to me. I'm, an, I'm Bashubu Fraser, honorary fellow at the Center for South Asian Studies. Uh, and uh, I'm also Professor Emerita of English and Creative Writing and uh, the director of the Scottish Center of Togo Studies. Uh, but today, this is all about Professor Murdo MacDonald, and we are delighted to have Murdo, who's an authority on uh, uh, art history, especially Scottish art history. Uh, Murdo MacDonald is Emeritus Professor of History of Scottish Art at the University of Dundee. He's the author of Scottish Art and Patrick Geddes's Intellectual Origins, he is a former editor of Edinburgh Review, and many of you will remember the uh, many marvelous issues that were brought out under his editorship. He's an honorary member of the Royal Scottish Academy and an honorary fellow of the Association of Scottish Literary Studies. Uh, he's a trustee of the Scottish Centre of Tago Studies, and we are really fortunate to have him on our board. Today, Murder will be talking on the visual art and cultural revival, Sister Nivedita, Patrick Geddes, and the Tagores. Uh, and I think I'm going to just hand it over to him rather than read the abstract because the paper will be much more interesting than me reading the abstract to you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Murder, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Bashabi. No, God. Right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, that's great, thanks. Good, great. It's a true honor to be invited to speak to the Center for South Asian Studies in my role as a trustee of the Scottish Center of Tagore Studies, which Bashabi has just mentioned. My thanks to Talat Ahmed in particular, and of course to Bashabi for making it possible. And from a personal perspective, I'm delighted to be speaking under the aegis of the University of Edinburgh for the simple reason that Edinburgh is the university that educated me. I was fortunate enough to be a student of George Davy, author of that defense of interdisciplinary thinking, the democratic intellect. And it is interdisciplinary thinking that give, gives me my starting point for all the thinkers I will be discussing today were interdisciplinary in their view. There are two members of the Tagore family, Rabindranath, of course, but also his nephew, also his nephew, Abanindranath, the leader of the Bengal School of Painters a crucial figure in the revival of Indian art in the early 20th century. Then there is Patrick Geddes, an ecologically minded Scot who worked in Edinburgh and Dundee, and, in, and indeed in London and Paris and various other places. And from the time of his first journey to India in 1914, entered into a deep exchange of thinking with Rabindranath Tagore and connecting them all is the remarkable figure of the Irish woman Margaret Noble, better known to us as Vivekananda's disciple, Sister Nivedita. Mention of Vivekananda is a reminder of the wider milieu I will be considering. It includes Vivekananda himself, but also the Japanese cultural revivalist Kakuzo Okakura, and Geddes's friend, the pioneering historian of Indian art, Ananda Kumraswamy. Crucial also are Jagadish Chandra Bose and his wife, Abala. And again, it is Nivedita who provides the link between them all. So how can we begin to better understand Sister Nivedita's role? Patrick Geddes is a good starting point. Nivedita and Geddes had much in common. Both were forward-looking educators before she met Vivekananda and took the name of Sister Nivedita, 
Margaret Noble was an advocate of the child-centered approaches of Petzolozzi and Froebel. She shared those interests with Geddes. But at the heart of the educational project for both Nevedita and Geddes was not just the education of children, but the education of communities. And in that regard, particularly, both had an awareness of the significance of visual art as an agent of change. Their shared advocacy of visual art can be understood through the work of the artists with whom they were closely linked. Both were key advocates of the significance of visual art to cultural revival. Geddes was a leadership figure of the Celtic revival in Scotland in the 1890s. His ideas of a renaissance of art and ideas in Scotland often expressed through the art of John Duncan. A decade later, Nivedita was a key supporter of the developing Bengal School of Painting, which was headed by Abhinindranath Tagore. I show here John Duncan's Anima Celtica from 1895 and Tagore's Varat Mata from 1905. I will discuss these images in a little more detail later. Another link between Nivedita and Geddes is that they both took Celtic languages, Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic respectively, for granted as part of their immediate family backgrounds. And that of course included the legends associated with those languages. Because the culture of both the Scottish and Irish Gaelic speaking areas had been oppressed by British policies for at least 200 years prior to the time they were working, both Geddes and Nivedita understood something of the difficulties and ironies faced by other cultures, such as that of India, under British imperial pressure. A further link between them is that they both moved in politically radical circles, and that underpinned their shared commitment to cultural revival. One of their mutual acquaintances was the Russian anarchist Peter Kropotkin, who we see here. Geddes had entertained Kropotkin in Edinburgh in 1886, and Nivedita would meet him in London in the mid 1890s. It was during that period that Kropotkin was writing the influential series of essays that were gathered and published as Mutual Aid, a Factor in Evolution, a book which explores the importance of both cooperation and individual altruism as fundamental principles of existence. Nivedita would review Kropotkin's book in 1907 for Prabuddha Varata. Uh, such ideas of social co cooperation combined with individual altruism underpinned the shared intellectual project of Gaddis and Nivedita for national cultural revivals as the basis for international cooperation. What they both advocated were cultural movements that grew from the needs of the people, not from the diktat of rulers. For both, such local needs were not simply economic, but crucially educational. Those educational needs had at their heart an appreciation of history and culture as they related to geographical location. And to make sense of that geographical location, the need was to understand its place in the wider world. And for both Nevedita and Geddes, the history and practice of art were core components enabling such understanding. They first met in America in early 1900 in the company of Swami Vivekananda at Ridgely Manor in New York State. At the time of that meeting, Geddes was 46 and Nivedita was 33. Later that year, they met again at the International Exhibition in Paris, an event which Geddes regarded as of such significance that he had moved his educational activities from Edinburgh to Paris for that year. In Paris, Vivekananda lectured, rejecting the Hellenistic influence on Indian art in favor of Hindu and Buddhist influences, a theme taken up by Nivedita and in due course by Ananda Kumraswamy. Now, the crucial point is that Vivekananda's position 
was a repost to the British imperial attempt to insist that there was no tradition of fine art in India, or if there was, it was an unimportant outgrowth of aesthetic developments driven by Europe. That denial of a high status fine art tradition was, of course, a coded justification for imperial domination. I will discuss that disjunction of views in more detail later with respect to Ananda Kumraswamy in particular. In Paris, Nivedita and Geddes worked together briefly, but without much success. More important was the development of a mutual and lasting respect and friendship. But crucial for both of them was that also in Paris for the International Exhibition of 1900, were the scientist Jagadish Chandra Bose and his wife Abala. Like Sister Nivedita, Abala Bose was a social activist, educator, and advocate of women's rights. Nivedita had already met the couple in Calcutta, and they would remain among her closest friends until her death in 1911. Two, de two decades after that Paris meeting, Geddes, by that time professor of, by that time professor of sociology and civics at the University of Bombay, would write J.C. Bose's biography. Geddes devotes chapter 17 to Bose's friendships, uh, and there he gives us a vivid description of Nivedita's intellectual commitment, noting that she had a keen appreciation of the importance of Bose's work for science in general and for scientific activities in India in particular. Geddes continues, Nivedita's combination of intellectual and personal idealism was fully aroused by Bose's discoveries and his difficulties in those days of convincing others of them. Her fervid faith in the long dreamed of research institute, its possibilities for science, and its promises for India was no small impulse and encouragement towards its realization. Now, complementing that enthusiasm for science, Geddes writes of Nivedita accompanying Jagadish and Abala Bose on a pilgrimage to the Ajanta Caves. Copies of the Ajanta murals made under the direction of Christiana Herringham and with the backing of Abhanindranath Tagore provided a crucial impulse to the new, new school of painting developing under Abhanindranath's leadership in Bengal. One of the copyists working with Herringham, Herringham was Nandalal Bose, a key figure of the new Bengal school of painting. And we see one of his remarkable Ajanta copies here. In his book on Bose, Geddes also provides insight into Abala Bose's significance as a thinker, activist, and educator, noting both her scientific training and her key role in advocacy, advocacy of girls' education in Calcutta. He illuminates Nivedita further by quoting Abala's concise and informative reflection on the loss of her friend in 1911. What Abala says is this, as a woman, I knew her in everyday life, full of austerity and possessed with a longing for righteousness, which shone round her like a pure flame. Others will know her as the great moral and intellectual force which came to us in time of great national need. In 1900, after her stay in Paris, Nivedita traveled to help traveled to London to help J.C. Bose prepare for a lecture he had been invited to present to the Royal Society. The subject was his pioneering research into plant physiological response. In his biography of Bose, Patrick Geddes spent several pages exploring the con controversy evoked at the Royal Society by the Indian scientists' new ideas. Now, with time, the opposition faded, and in 1920, Bose was himself elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. But with respect to Sister Nivedita, Bose's stay in London was important in two ways. Bose was unwell at the time, and after his lecture, he entered a nursing home to have an operation. During his convalescence, Nivedita spent time with him, 
deepening her understanding of Indian cultural and spiritual traditions. In the work of her biographer, uh, sorry, in the words of her biographer, Lizelle Raymond, Nivedita became his pupil. At the same time, she would have been well aware of the professional obstacles to bows that Geddes discusses. That would have further strengthened her unstinting support for Bose's writings and projects. Now, in London, Nivedita also experienced at first hand the British imperial disdain for Indian intellectual initiatives. The source of that disdain was Sir George Birdwood, who oversaw educational affairs at the India office. The event, uh, where Nivedita experienced this was a lunch organized by her friend and Vivekananda's supporter, Mrs. Sarah Bull. The others present were Birdwood and the Parsi industrial, industrialist Jamsetji Tata. The purpose of the lunch was to enable Tata to meet Birdwood informally in order to, as Raymond writes, press his plan for the founding of an independent university for Indians with Indian funds and to find out why his project had so far been blocked. No, there was no progress. Birdwood seemed to find the idea of Indians in control of their own education an absurdity. But there was one positive outcome. Birdwood's active opposition to Tata's project strengthened Nivedita's resolve to support what Birdwood would not. The period in Paris and then in London before she returned to India in late 1901 was a crucial time of development for Nivedita's thinking and writing. She also spent time in Brittany, Scotland and Norway. In Brittany, Vivekananda had given her his blessing, in Scotland, she visited Patrick Geddes and lectured. On her return to London, at the prompting of Bose's friend, the economic historian R.C. Dutt, she began work on her book, The Web of Indian Life. She continued to work on it in the peace and quiet of Mrs. Bull's Norwegian property. Now, Dutt was also an early translator of Ramayana and Mahavarata. He is one of only two persons named in Nivedita's note of thanks that prefaces her book. The other is Patrick Gaddis, who, Nivedita writes, by teaching me to understand a little of Europe, gave me a method by which to read my Indian experiences. Nivedita remained one of Gaddis's intellectual allies up to her death in 1911. And in a tribute published in 1913, Geddes emphasized their common methods when he wrote that her career could not be fully appreciated without some corresponding grasp of the geographical outlooks and evolutionary methods which she so clearly held. Geddes regarded that integration of modern science and traditional religious values as one of the main clues to Nivedita's rare range of sympathy and understanding, and I'm quoting Gaddis here, rare range of sympathy and understanding at home as she could be either in Paris or in Calcutta, and to her essential life pilgrimage, as Gaddis puts it, from west to east. And he goes on to quote Nivedita herself. The foundation stone of our knowledge, says Nivedita, the foundation stone of our knowledge of a people must be an understanding of their region. For social structure depends primarily upon labor and labor is necessarily determined by place. Thus we reach the secret of thought and ideals. And that was very much the method of thinking that uh, Nivedita thanked Geddes for in the preface to The Web of Indian Life. At the same time, in the memorial, sorry, in the same memorial volume to which Geddes contributed, Rabindranath Tagore paid tribute to Nivedita as a mother of the people. Now, 
that's a telling description for it brings to mind the image I showed earlier, that seminal image of the revival in Bengali painting, Varat Mata, or to give it its English title, India the Mother, painted in 1905 by Aban Indranath Tagore. That image was reviewed by Nivedita in Prabhasi in 1906, and under the title of India the Mother in The Indian World. Those writings were an appropriate beginning to Nivedita's perceptive and polemical critic, critical writings about Indian art as an agent of change. For Nivedita, Varat Mata was a picture which bids fair to prove the beginning of a new age of Indian art. She considered it the first great masterpiece in a new style. And she continues, I would reprint it if I could by tens of thousands and scatter it broadcast over the land. As you can see, it takes the form of a woman holding objects in the manner of a four-armed Hindu deity. However, the objects themselves are not conventionally religious, but rather emblems of secular nationalist aspiration towards economic and cultural self-sufficiency. They represent food, clothing, secular learning, and spiritual knowledge. In political significance, the image relates to the unrest that accompanied the partition of Bengal. In Partha Mitter's words, artists entered the political arena in 1905, the year that Bengal was partitioned at Curzon's request. Now, Apanandranath's style draws on Mughal and Rajput paintings of earlier centuries and on traditional Hindu imagery, but it also owes a debt to the revivalist art of Japan, which was then developing under the influence of Kakuzu Okakura. Now, that was a significant stim stimulus for Okakura had traveled to Calcutta in 1902 to meet Vivekananda, who was by that time in his final illness. And after Vivekananda's death in July of that year, Nivedita made the links that Okakura needed, in particular with the Tagore family. The trust that Okakura placed in Nivedita is indicated by the fact that she contributed a substantial introduction to his book, Ideals of the East, a book that is in essence a pan-Asian manifesto. It was published in 1903, and the same year Okakura's students, Yokoyama Taikan and Hishida Shunso, traveled to Calcutta to work closely with Abhinindranath Tagore. Soon Okakura would accept a role at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, as would in due course Ananda Kumaraswamy. It was during his time in Boston that Okakura wrote his most well-known work, an introduction to Zen Buddhism for Western readers, The Book of Tea. Now, although Patrick Geddes never met Okakura, analogy between the thinking of the two men has been drawn by Kiyoshi, Kiyoshi Okutsu uh, of, uh, of Yamaguchi University, who has also explored the impact of Geddes's thinking on the pioneer of modern Japanese literature, Natsumi Soseki. It's intriguing, but perhaps not surprising to find both Nivedita and Geddes, the latter at least in spirit, in such distinguished Japanese company. But moving back to India, as I noted earlier, one can see Abhinindranath Tagore's work as analogous to that of John Duncan, an artist who was Geddes's close colleague in Scotland. Indeed, Duncan's Awakening of Cahoolan which we see here, a mural painted for Ramsey Lodge in Edinburgh in 1896, bears the same awakening message of the necessity of cultural revival as Varat Mata, but in a Celtic rather than an Indian context. The analogy is even stronger with Duncan's Anima Celtica, the soul or spirit of the Celt, which appeared in Geddes's magazine, The Evergreen in 1895. Anima Celtica shares with Varat Mata a female personification of nation, 
But when Tagore invokes the past through the traditional pose of his figure, Duncan invokes it through antiquarian reference and legendary imagery. Where Tagore invokes the future through symbolic objects representing clothing, learning, food, and spiritual salvation. For Duncan, and by extension for Geddes, the future is implied as a book ready to be reopened. However, there is another aspect of Duncan's image, for the central image is modeled, sorry, sorry the central figure is modeled on the distinguished Celtic scholar, Ella Carmichael. So scholarship of the present and by extension the future is asserted. And that educational message is mirrored in Varat Mata. So the message of cultural revival driven by education is the same. The pages of the London-based arts and crafts magazine, The Studio, linked the aspirations of Sister Nivedita and Abhinandranath Tagore on the one hand to those of Patrick Geddes and John Duncan on the other. Now, that is important because in 1903, the radical Calcutta-based arts administrator, Ernest Binfield Harville, to whom Nivedita gave her full support, gave notice of the new movement in Indian, Indian art in that journal. In 1908, Harvel's definitive article on the Bengal school also appeared in the studio, complete with a reproduction of Varat Mata, and we see that here. Harvel comments in a manner worthy of Franz Fanon or Ngugi wa Thiongo, that the British had and I'm quoting Harvel here, succeeded in persuading educated Indians that they have no art of their own, though the evidences of its existence are many and great. That same year saw the publication of Harvel's book, Indian Sculpture and Painting. Now, it's been pointed out by Tapati Gurtakurta that Nivedita's review of that book was as important for Indian, for Indian readers as the book itself. That review was published in 1909, and Nivedita begins it thus. We have here for the first time a book about Indian art written by a European, which expresses throughout its pages a feeling of love and respect for India and her people. To Mr. Havel, Indian art is no mere toy of commerce, nor is it even the fruit of some rich bygone period irretrievably departed. He sees India, past, present and future as one. One of Havel's key sources was the up and coming Ananda Kumaraswamy, whose thinking was just beginning to make an impact. When Nivedita and Geddes had met in Paris in 1900, Kumbraswamy was still studying for a geology degree in London. But within a few years, he had established himself as a significant cultural nationalist figure. In due course, he became the most influential historian of Indian art of the first half of the 20th century. Kumbraswamy's importance is that he provided the art historical scholarship needed to establish the psychological and aesthetic independence of early, of early Indian sculpture from European models. One finds Havel quoting Kumaraswamy again, and at considerable length, in his 1911 book, The Ideals of Indian Art. Kumaraswamy was also strongly aware of Celtic cultures, and that again connected him to both Nivedita and to Geddes. An unexpected indication of this is to be found in his early work as a geologist. In a publication from 1903, he reflects on the composition of the marble to be found in the Scottish islands of Tyree and Iona. It is hard to imagine Kumaraswamy visiting those spiritually significant islands without taking an interest in their history and folklore and art. He maintained that interest to the end of his life, so much so that his death in 1947 was lamented by the distinguished analyst of Celtic art, George Bain, in his classic work on the topic, which we see here. 
Insight into the high regard in which Kumaraswamy held both Gaddis and Nivedita can be found in his essay, Education and Salon, dating from 1911 and published the next year in Art and Swadeshi. What Kumaraswamy says is this, I should like to see deputations of Selenese young men sent to Europe, to Denmark, France, Hungary, Finland, Ireland, and also to America and Japan to study what is being done by leaders of education here, see what experiments are being made and learn what education really means. I should like them also to study very seriously Indian history and culture for two years. Above all, I should like them to come under the personal influence of men like Professor Geddes and women like Sister Nevedita. They would then be qualified by knowledge and responsibility, as they should even now by inheritance, to shape and create. I repeat, above all, I should like them to come under the personal influence of men like Professor Geddes and women like Sister Nivedita. That is an extraordinary endorsement from Kumaraswamy. Sadly, his comment would not be published until after Nivedita's death. Nivedita had visited Kumaraswamy in England in 1908, and Kumaraswamy's biographer, Rog Roger Lipsy, has drawn attention to an invitation card which asked friends to meet Nivedita at the Kumaraswamy house, where she would give a talk on the life of Indian women in relation to religion, education and nationalism. The same year, Kumaraswamy's first major book, Medieval Sinhalese Art, was published. Nivedita greeted it with enthusiasm, and in her review, she looks forward with eagerness to other works by Kumaraswamy. She had already quoted him and noted his potential in 1907 in her review of Abhinindranath Tagore's uh, Abhinindranath Tagore's pioneering painting, which has strong Mughal art influence, as you can see, The Passing of Shah Jahan, published in the Modern Review. Uh, that's when Nivedita's review was published. Her praise for Kumaraswamy's approach in medieval Sin Sinhalese art is unstinting. The reviewer of a work like this, she says, is always confronted by the impossibility of more than hinting at the wealth to be found in it. A classic has been written and written from the Eastern standpoint by one fully competent to have dealt with a Western subject of the same kind with equal authority. All who know the writer will look with eagerness for further works from his pen. But what of the continuation of such studies by Indian scholars? The field of research is unlimited. It is that context of mutual purpose that allows us to appreciate the crucial role that Kumaraswamy performed after Nivedita's death in 1911, for he stepped in to finish her book, Myths of the Hindus and Buddhists. That book has a double significance. It made available to the West in highly readable prose key passages of Indian legend, and at the same time, through its careful illustration under the direction of Abhinindranath Tagore, it acted as a showcase for the Bengal school of painting. It includes 32 images, three of which I show here, and they are all reproduced to a high standard in color, each given a page to itself. Thus, in addition to its literary merit, it is an exhibition in book form. Kumaraswamy's introduction is something of a eulogy for Nivedita, in which he notes the high regard for her in both West and East. Kumaraswamy says, Sister Nivedita, to whom the present work was first entrusted, needs no introduction to Western or to Indian readers. And later he says, through her books, Nivedita became not merely an interpreter of India to Europe, but even more the inspiration of a new race of Indian students, no longer anxious to be anglicized, but convinced that all real progress, 
as distinct from mere political controversy, must be based on national ideals upon intentions already clearly expressed in religion and art. Kumaraswamy thus under, underlines Nivedita's importance as a teacher of Indian culture, both to Indian students and to Europeans, such as Patrick Geddes. In 1912, the year after Nivedita's death, Kumaraswamy wrote to Geddes, hoping that if he were visiting London, he would be able to attend lectures held by the India Society. Now, that invitation seems innocuous enough, but in fact, the founding of the India Society in London two years earlier had been a defining moment of resistance to the British imperial perspective on Indian art. Sir George Birdwood was again among the imperial protagonists, and the cultural dynamics echo those so evident at Nivedita's lunch with Birdwood and Tata in 1900. So just as in 1900, Birdwood had denied to India the status of proper development of higher education, in 1910, along with imperially minded, along with the imperially minded historian of Indian art, Vincent Smith, Birdwood was intent on denying to India the status of a proper fine art tradition. The issue came to a head after a lecture by Harvel at the Royal, uh, sorry, at the Royal Society of Arts in London, and the controversy generated led to the foundation of the India Society. It should be emphasized that both Smith and Birdwood admired Indian art, but as, as Partha Mitter notes, what Birdwood failed to see was the patronizing element in his admiration. That patronizing element is crucial for the admiration, genuine insofar as it went, was for what, as I have already noted, were regarded as the relatively minor aesthetic achievements of an irredeemably lesser culture. So consciously or not, the Birdwood Smith position was a way of justifying the imperial status quo by denying to Indian culture and, ident and identifying high status feature of European culture, namely a firmly rooted tradition of fine art. On the 11th of January, 1910, Vincent, Vincent Smith lectured at the Royal Asiatic Society on what Mitter describes as the well-worn theme that higher arts did not exist in India, deliberately provoking Harvel and Kumaraswamy. Two days later, Harvel gave a scheduled lecture, Arts Administration in India, to the India section of the Royal Society of Arts. In the chair was none other than Sir George Birdwood, who, with a characteristic sense of imperial entitlement, felt able to dismiss the notion of Indian fine art through analogy between a statue of the Buddha and a suet pudding. In retrospect, that comment is so absurd as to seem funny, but its real importance is that it is an example of the passive aggressive nature of British imperial discourse. Havel's lecture and the discussion following it, including Birdwood's comment, was printed in the Journal of the Royal Society of Arts the following month. It makes for fascinating reading. Just as Birdwood's impressive failure of perception 10 years earlier had spurred Nivedita into action, it now spurred Havel and Kumaraswamy, who, along with the English artist William Rothenstein, formed the India Society to genuinely represent Indian culture. Soon, William Rothenstein would make a celebrated series of drawings of Rabindranath Tagore on his, visual, on his visit to London in 1911 and 12. One of these would be used as the frontispiece to Tagore's prose translations of Gitanjali, and with his typical regard for the cultural importance of visual art, Tagore dedicated his book to Rothenstein. Gitanjali was first published by the India Society in 1912.
the first popular edition came out the next year with the publisher Macmillan, who in that same year of 1913 also published The Crescent Moon with a beautiful cover by the poet and artist T. Sturge Moore. Typically, Tagore dedicates the book to Moore, carrying on the practice of honoring visual art that one finds in Gitanjali. But the crescent moon has another importance, for it has eight color plates by Bengal school artists, such as the one that I show by Nandalal Bose. And these plates complement the larger exposure of those arts, artists in Nivedita and Kumaraswamy's myths of the Hindus and Buddhists, to which I've already drawn attention. Uh, and of course, that was also published in 1913. Again, in 1913, Kumaraswamy published his definitive statement on the independent validity of Indian art in the influential London-based journal, the Burlington Magazine. That paper, Indian Images with Many Arms, was reprinted in Kumaraswamy's key essay collection of 1918, The Dance of Shiva, published in New York, the year after he had taken up his role at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. On the first page of his paper, Kumaraswamy elegantly demolishes the, the arguments put forward by Smith. Uh, sorry, I think someone's actually got their uh, microphone on. Uh, if they could just mute it, that'd be great. I've just turned it off. So. Uh, okay, on the first page of his paper, Kumaraswamy elegantly demolishes the arguments put forward by Smith, Birdwood and others by pointing out that their negative comments could be applied equally to numerous European works from classical Renaissance and modern periods, and that they are therefore null and void as criticism, uh, and that they are therefore null and void as criticism and exist only as prejudice. He then spends the rest of his paper significantly deepening the reader's perception of Indian sculpture. But in the 1918 version of his paper, he adds an interesting footnote. What he writes is this. It is fair to say that Mr. Vincent Smith's opinions have been considerably modified since 1910. So clearly the battle fought by members of the India Society was being won. Now, Patrick Geddes absorbed the arguments that led to the foundation of the, Indian so of the India Society into his own and published form in 1912 in his dramatic text, The Mask of Ancient Learning. There he writes of Indian art as a subject which we have long failed even to recognize, much less to penetrate or comprehend. And he continues, the artist with Apanindranath Tagore and Mrs. Harrington, Herringham, the teacher with Mr. Harville, and the critic with Sister Nivedita and Dr. Kumaraswamy are at length revealing to us its beauty and its significance. There is also an unpublished and undated lecture by Geddes entitled The Divine Ideal in Indian Art. It has a clear link in its title to Harville's book, The Ideals of Indian Art, published in 1911. Indeed, Harville's book contains a chapter entitled The Development of the Divine Ideal. Geddes clearly held Harville in high regard, for in 1929 he would appoint him as director of the Indian College established, uh, established by Geddes uh, beside his Scots College that he, he had established in Montpellier in the south of France. In passing, I should note that the president of that Geddes established Indian college was Rabindranath Tagore, who wrote a memorable poem for the opening. Uh, indeed, that poem occurs as the epigraph to um, Tagore's book, The Religion of Man. Now, to return to uh, the change of Vincent Smith's position that Kumaraswamy mentions, it's interesting that in Harvel's preface to the second edition of his book, published in 1920, which we see here, he notes a similar change in attitude. 
he writes that Indian art has now obtained a far wider recognition and a fuller understanding than it had when the first edition was published. Now, Birdwood had died in 1917, and it clearly crossed, crossed Harville's mind. It clearly crossed Harville's mind to adjust his text in the light of the new, more positive situation. However, he decided not to revise the passages, which related to the opinions, most prominently those of Smith and Birdwood, current at the time of the first edition, that's to say 1911. He was no doubt well aware of how easily prejudice could swing in the other direction. As a result, the second edition retains its value not only as a remarkable book about Indian art, but as a record of the struggle that led to the foundation of the India Society. In 1914, Geddes traveled to India for the first time. His son Arthur, who would become close to Rabindranath Tagore, fluent in Bengali and a translator of Tagore's songs, recalls that when in 1915 Geddes came to Calcutta, bringing the cities and town planning exhibition, it was natural that Tagore should come to see it and meet its maker, but, and that Geddes should seek Tagore. They met and their friendship began and grew. Indeed, no one has better characterized Geddes than Tagore, who wrote that he had the precision of a scientist and the vision of a prophet, and at the same time, the power of an artist to make his ideas visible. There was a profound exchange of ecological and cultural insight between the two men. The contact was often mediated by Arthur, who was resident at Srinikatan and helped plan its development in 1923 and 1924. Many years later, in 1961, Arthur would organize an event devoted to Tagore's songs in translation at the Edinburgh Festival. The booklet accompanying that event concluded with an image by Tagore from 1932. It's an example of the extraordinary way that Tagore was making his own ideas visible in experimental modernist artworks, which in part had their origins in visual experiments with text, and sometimes, as in this case, integrated word and image. This particular work was made on May the 24th of that year of 1932. Patrick Geddes had died on 17th of April, I'm still not sure if this was Tagore's elegy for Geddes, but the dates match, so it may well have been. And Tagore writes, the night has ended. Put out the light of the lamp of thine own narrow corner smudged with smoke. The great morning which is for all appears in the east, let its light reveal us to each other walk on the same path of pilgrimage. And certainly the words are very appropriate to Geddes, for whom, like Tagore, the idea of pilgrimage was a key to life, as it was, of course, to so many of the figures I have noted here, not, niece, not least Jagadish and Abala Bose, but perhaps in particular, the woman with whom I began who acted as such a key link between them all. Sister Nivedita, thank you for listening. Thank you, Murdo, for that amazing talk. It, it was erudite, it took us on a wonderful journey. You have shown how cultural revival through education, uh, for education through visual art is crucial to society. And uh, it's wonderful the way he, you have placed Nivedita as the key figure who brought all these great men together in a circle of understanding and uh, evaluation of what mattered in life. 
I'm also glad that you have uh, shown how cultural revival can only be achieved uh, through international understanding and mutual respect, which Sister Nivedita and Patrick Geddes both had for Indian art and Indian artists. And I'm especially, uh, for me, it was a learning curve to know about Havel, who played such a key role in promoting uh, the modern school of art in India with Abhinindranath and Nandalal Bosch and others. So I'll open it now to questions because I'm sure many people have questions. And uh, uh, once again, I just want to thank Hugo and Talat for organizing this and the Center for South Asian Studies. And I can see many uh, South Asian Studies members here, as well as people who uh, love this subject. So whoever wants to ask a question, if you could unmute yourself and even show yourself if you are up to it. Thank you. Well, if there are no questions forthcoming, I think I'll begin as the chair. I have, a, have the privilege. Um, you spoke about the culture, about cultural revival, the Celtic twilight, both Gaelic and Gaelic. I just wondered if you would like to uh, comment on Sister Nivedita being actually a crucial figure in the Bengal Renaissance which coincided with the Celtic revival. Well, well I, I, I think it's so interesting that she was born in Dungannon in, in Ireland and then spent a lot of time in, in, in London. I think she met Vivek, Vivekananda in, in, in London. And then her, uh, her, her role in, in Bengal, I mean, uh, from, from my point of view, uh, which is obviously the visual art point of view, I mean, it was absolutely crucial. I mean, we, we've heard also about Havel, who is someone who I still think has not been given sufficient attention because um, he made the, the wonderful act of getting rid of the Western art from the, the museum in Calcutta and buying Indian art instead, which is, is probably one of the uh, well, it, it's a great act of, of cultural revival. And I, I would actually myself like to know more about the the, the absolute links between Nivedita and, and Havel, but they were so very much on the same page and her her review of her of, of his book was was so important. And um, the the way she acted as a link um, between uh, uh, Abhinindranath and the Japanese artists who are also very important. I mean, there's, um, uh, I mean, she, she just seemed to be right in there doing everything. And then there's the whole um, um, social and educational side, which uh, she sh shared with uh, Abala Bose. And then there's the, then there's the, uh, the incredible impetus she gave to uh, the creation of Jagadish Chandra Bose's Scientific Institute. I mean, she's uh, a quite extraordinary woman and other people know uh, more about uh, the other side and perhaps I know uh, enough about the, the art side. But uh, again, uh, I mean, it fascinates me the way that um, Aban Indranath was picking up on uh, Mughal and Rajput art. And then suddenly, thanks, probably to Nivedita, he gets uh, the introduction to Okakura and then Okakura sends uh, his Japanese students to work with uh, Ab Abhinindranath. And, and so you get the, the, the beginnings of looking again at Indian art by Abhinindranath and then this sudden impulse when he realizes that the Japanese artists are doing something similar already. And, and I think Nivedita acts as a crucial link in the, in the middle of that. Thank you. Yes, she was an amazing catalyst. Uh, I have two people with their hands up. First, I think, was Anjali and then Talat. So, Anjali, if you would like to go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Bashavi, and thank you, Mordo, for an interesting presentation. Um, 
Uh, I think I have two short questions, may not be directly related to the discipline, but I was just curious to ask. So uh, I'm asking you. So during uh, my schooling in India, uh, normally in the history textbooks, we used to always read and hear about Annie Besant and her struggle as a woman activist and the founder of Theosophical Society. But uh, I didn't happen to uh, actually learn about Sister Nevedata so much during the British uh, imperialism phase and um, mainly in the uh, history textbooks uh, there. So I was wondering if they both happened to know each other at some point and who was, if anyone was influenced by the other, Annie Besant and Sister Nivedita, and if they had any kind of uh, uh, exchange, cultural exchange or writing exchange uh, during that period. Another question was, uh, as a woman researcher and working during that historical uh, period of uh, British imperialism, uh, how challenging was it for women activists like Sister Nivedita to work, write and survive uh, during that phase, both in India and in Britain, and also frequently traveling for uh, her research and understanding of the work, art and literature, and having uh, that frequent interaction uh, with all the uh, all various uh, different scholars during that period how challenging was it for her if she if you happen to know about that that phase of her life and how tolerant was actually the british society in terms of her writing i just wanted to know that thank you <laughs> thank you very very interesting questions i, I think the annie besant one is uh, fascinating because Geddes has long links with Annie Besant, even uh, long before either of them went to India, for uh, Besant was a little bit older than Geddes, but at the time Geddes was studying in London uh, as a student, uh, Besant, uh, as a woman, was unable to learn about biology, so Geddes actually acted as her tutor. So there's, there's a, a long-term link between Geddes and Besant there. And I know that they, um, they um, re, uh, remade those links when Geddes went to India. And, uh, but I don't know too much about um, links between Nivedita and, and Besant. Uh, I would be surprised if there were none. Uh, but there's another very interesting aspect uh, on the theosophical side, uh, which is that John Duncan, the Celtic revival artist, became a theosophist in 1909. And he was later commissioned by uh, the, would it be the Ananda College in Colombo uh, to do a series of images of the life of the Buddha. Uh, so that was a theosophical college, I think, set up by Colonel Olcott. Uh, so the, the theosophical dimension is actually very important here. Uh, and another aspect of it is that Geddes, in the, in the lecture that I mentioned, um, The Divine Ideal in Indian Art, which is only available in TypeScript, um, he mentions a Japanese monk, uh, Ekai Kawaguchi, and Kawaguchi wrote a book called Three Years in Tibet, which was published by probably about, oh, maybe 1910 or so, by the uh, Theosophical, um, uh, the, uh, the Theosophical Press in Adya. So the theos Theosophical aspect is very important. Uh, to turn to the other aspect of the question, uh, how Nivedita coped with the her her, uh, her role as as a woman I think someone else would probably be much better at answering that perhaps Bashabi than 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 I am uh, however uh, it's quite clear that she was taken very seriously both in London uh, and in in uh, other parts of Britain and in uh, and in Calcutta uh, but um, but precisely how she negotiated that, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think um, my brief answer to that was, uh, is that she uh, had the full support of Lady Obula Bush, 
and Lady Abulabo had great standing in uh, Bengali society and also in London. Uh, and of course, there was Sarah Bull who also uh, really supported her. Uh, she was a thorn in the flesh for the um, uh, for British administration in India, but we also must remember um, she she was a very independent woman, and because she uh, ventured into the education of of girls and Indian art and history, uh, they she wasn't they didn't touch her much because she wasn't really. Uh, responsible for any of the aggressive nationalism the, that they were more wary of, I, I would say. Uh, but one thing we must remember is she was actually uh, responsible for designing the first Indian national flag, which if you go to J.C. Bush's house, you will still see. So uh, she was an Indian nationalist, but uh, she wasn't uh, a tremendous threat in that sense because she was an art critic and an educator as well and had to go and the Bush's uh, support and backing. But I think I should now ask Talat to step in because her hand has been up for a long time. Uh, thank you, Bashabi, and uh, thank you, Murdo, for a really fascinating talk. Um, I certainly learned a huge amount. Um, yes, I was quite struck by um, Anjali's question because I think that um, when you think about um, Sister Nevedita and also the whole question of um, other women such as Annie Besant, I mean I'm remembering um, a book that um, I came across a while back uh, which I think the title of it was something like Occidental Daughters um, of Mother India um, and in many respects I think that's a very apt um, description of both of those two women, um, which, uh, which I think is really fascinating. Um, and also um, that uh, I also recall an article um, along the lines of they belong to one nation, but you know, two Irish women belonging to one nation, they stem from one part of the world, but actually they, they position themselves in a much, much bigger, um, in a bigger society. Um, and I think that that, um, to me, is something that that I always think of when, um, I mean, I know more about Basant than I do um, about Sister Nevedita, but I think the other thing that's also quite critical about the issue of theosophy um, is that, particularly in its early years, the influence of it and those individuals that came under uh, the orbit of theosophical ideas um, were very much part and parcel of this non-conformist world in the sense that they were quite mistrustful and rejected um, what were the many, you know, many of the shibboleths of their existing society. Um, and so obviously um, the questioning of what was sort of religion and what was spiritualism and moving away from the idea that it was just something which was Christian in ethos was one aspect. And therefore the whole sense of wanting to um, have a sense of intermingling of different kinds of traditions that they saw in terms of spiritualism and its ideas emanating from different parts of the world was very critical, um, I think, to, to their thinking. Um, the other thing I was very struck that early on in your slides, you had um, the image there of um, Kropotkin, of course, um, you know, in terms of Russian anarchism, because this is also another very critical influence, which again is part and parcel of that very non-conformist, um, milieu of individuals, um, you know, I mean, you know, you, you could add um, Tolstoy to that, you could, one could even add Gandhi to that, um, in terms of people who had a very cosmopolitan outlook in terms of how they were thinking about the world and the circles that these, that these people were moving in. Um, and so I suppose my question, but yeah, I, mean, I suppose that's a, that's a comment, but my question, Murdo, is, um, is twofold. One is um, what um, the, 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 this milieu is a milieu which is imbibed with art, imbibed with culture, imbibed with ideas to do with religion and otherwise, um, but also ideas to do with anti-colonialism. Um, in, in its various forms, um, I mean, I think this is the other thing, that there isn't just one type of anti-colonialism 
in this period. There are all kinds of different uh, sorts of traditions. Um, but certainly, Sister Nevedita, I think, well, my question is, you know, does she put her, does she identify herself very firmly as an anti-colonialist? Um, I mean, given the fact that she was also Irish, the whole question of Irish home rule was something that was very important um, at the time. Um, so how important was it to her? The other thing about um, Nivedita is that um, she did spend, if I'm right, some of her time in England, um, and particularly in terms of the kinds of the, the jobs that she had in terms of being a school teacher and being a headmistress. Um, many of them were in areas where, again, um, you know, she deliberately wanted to go to areas um, which where where she felt um, that there was a need. Um, so, for example, um, she was she taught in mining school areas. Um, you know, I, I think I think that's also something which is quite critical to her being. Um, so I just want to know what your response would be to that. And my final question, I suppose, is um, linked to this, because you began by talking about interdisciplinarity, which I think is quite a critical thing. And I'm quite struck by how, yes, of course, there's um, a multidisciplinary look that one can have in terms of academic scholarship. So, yes, art, history politics, etc. But this sense of interdisciplinarity also, I think, goes beyond that in terms of the lives that you've been talking about today, because it is also very much about a form of activism, an activism which is very much rooted um, in a late 19th century, early 20th century milieu. Um, but I think that, that yeah, that, that's also something that I was quite struck by. So, yeah, I, I just wondered what your responses would be to, to those points. Yeah, Thank very you. I, I think in the uh, on the anti-colonialist side, I, I I think that's definitely true of uh, Sister Nivedita, uh, and um, it's Gaddis is always harder to pin a particular position on, simply because he deliberately avoided all positions, but his best friends were anarchists. You know that that's just the way it worked out. But um, but Nivedita. Um, it, it's quite interesting because there's a kind of radical um, radical Puritanism in Christian terms in Nevedita because she was, uh, I think she eventually may have been attracted to Catholicism, but she started off, her, her religious background was actually Congregationalist. Uh, now, the, the relevant, uh, and Geddes's background was actually uh, Presbyterian. Now, Congregationalist is, is in a way, uh, Presbyterianism, you, you still have the elders. Congregationalism, you just have the congregation. But they're both radically democratic. And I think that's relevant um, regardless of their spiritual beliefs. And most churches would have thrown Geddes out immediately, even though he claimed to be interested in them. Um, the, uh, the, the key thing here is that they had a mode of organization uh, albeit Christian, which in secularized form was actually very, very democratic. And I think that's something that underlines both their views in terms of how uh, governance should happen. And of course, that's intrinsically anti-colonialist uh, because it's, it's, it's uh, bottom up, not top down. And I, I think that's an important aspect of Nivedita. Uh, and Nivedita, I, I've never been absolutely clear on her uh, exactly where she stood on Irish questions, but I suspect she was uh, pretty close there to W.B. Yeats, who, again, from a different area of Protestantism, but very much an Irish nationalist. And it's forgotten how much Irish nationalism actually stemmed from uh, Protestant intellectuals. I mean, we, we think of it as being a uh, as a as a Catholic movement, but of course it, it wasn't. It, it was both. Um, so that's really where Nivedita is coming from. Interestingly enough, um, she has been recently reappropriated by her birthplace of Dungannon, uh, who uh, uh, as actually uh, a very very important example of how to look at questions of culture and national integration and and. Um, Dungannon, of course, is in, in the north of Ireland. So, so uh, she, uh, uh, she is becoming more important politically in an Irish situation. 
uh, most certainly. And this again links up with her uh, anti-colonialist stance. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, the, the interdisciplinary side um, is I think very interesting because again, uh, I think interdisciplinarity is another extremely democratic approach to um, education and to culture in general. I mean, as soon as you admit that all forms of knowledge have a, uh, have a right to be heard, so to speak, uh, you are beginning to remove hierarchies and look more at communities of knowledge. And so, so I think that interdisciplinary aspect that you know, George Davy called democratic intellect and all the rest of it, uh, I think that that is actually very, very relevant to, to Geddes and to uh, Nivedita. And of course, as I made clear to people like the Tagores and, and, and the, 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 the Bose family in, in, in particular. So yes, the interdisciplinary side, I think is, is very important as a, a wider, I don't know, heuristic, perhaps, you know, it's, it's a, it, as soon as you accept interdisciplinarity, a lot of other things fall into place. Uh, right, uh, any, do you want to come back on that, Talat, on all the bits I've forgotten to answer? No, that was a fairly comprehensive answers. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Talat and Madhu. Are there any more questions or comments? There, there is a question in the chat from Sruti. Um, so it says, thank you for the fascinating talk and as the chair remarked, taking us on this journey. It appears that the interactions between these few individuals have played a great role in the making of India as a cultural entity. I've always felt that the creation of a myth of India with a shared culture has been absolutely necessary and preceded the creation of India as a nation state. I wonder if you agreed. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that, <laughs> to, to be honest. I, I mean, I, I do think, um, um, I, I think the, the way I'd look at that is that any anything that one might call a nation is always a very pluralistic thing. Uh, I mean, this, that's true in Scotland. I, I'm sure it's true in India as well. And, and it gets back to the interdisciplinary point. And I think what's important for, well, really anywhere, is that that pluralism is linked uh, in some way rather than fragmented. And I, I think the key thing about Nivedita is that she allowed the linkages to take place. Could I perhaps come in just on that point about pluralism? So, so and as we were discussing at the, the outset, my, my work is a world away from yours. So I found this really fascinating. Um, but because I work with Dalit movements and a lot of them have started using art now, a lot of what you're presenting seems sort of fairly elitist in, in, in some ways and presents a particular portrait of Indian art and Indian culture. So to what extent did this school engage with issues of inequality and caste and so on and so forth? Well, I, I think that's a very interesting question. I mean, obviously, if you're looking at fine art traditions and you're concerned with uh, their rejection by imperial uh, administrators, uh, you're in theory, looking at uh, the kind of high posh end of things, but actually you're not really, or rather you are on one level, but the fine art tradition is always open to everyone just because it's what we all do, you know? Uh, and I think the thing about Nivedita is that on the one hand, you find her defending things at the highest level against Birdwood. And on the other hand, you find her engaging directly with people on the street. And again, this is one of her immense strengths uh, and in that she does not make a distinction between the two, which of course is, a, in my view, exactly the right approach. And the same would be true of Gerdes. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just come in on that and add that uh, the School of Modern Art also imbibed uh, the whole culture of Kaligrat 
the Kaligat report, which, which is very much folk art. And also, if you look at the uh, images, uh, uh, the four-armed goddess, uh, that, that is, is folk craftsmanship, um, you know, re really prompting uh, responses in, if we call them elitist artists. So I think it's all very interwoven over there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments? Uh, Debaroti, if you could unmute yourself. Yes. Can you Good to see you. Hear me? Yes. During uh, the meetings, or the, uh, uh, there are two questions and one observation kind of a thing. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. It, it's, it's very unclear. So maybe if you turn your yes. video off, then we'll be able uh, to hear you better. Yeah. Um, the the you have my uh, video. Yes. Can you hear me now? Better uh, is it better? Yes. Okay. Uh, I I was wondering. Yes, I was wondering if. Uh, uh, I was just thinking of uh, a kind of uh, uh, evolution that comes into my mind when we are talking about revivalism at the earlier stage and when we go on to the latter part of Tego's life when he turned into an artist at the ripe old age uh, kind of a thing. Uh, he is more into a confluence of cultures and art forms and uh, is it a movement kind of a away from revivalism to uh, a confluence that we are talking about. By that, that time, Nivedita was uh, not there. But uh, I mean, uh, I, I was just wondering if uh, uh, Vivekananda talking about her, uh, I mean, objecting to her being a political activist, but actually encouraging her to become a social activist, educational activist, this kind of a thing was of the earlier period, and later on it changes a little. Uh, are we also looking into that kind of a changing situation? That was my question. And the observation was that I am reminded not of a painting, but of a word picture by Sister Nivedita in 1898, when she's talking about the plague, uh, the Calcutta plague, and she's talking about the young scavenger boys and the pain picture is almost like uh, she's talking about how robust, how handsome this young scavenger untouchable boys are. And she's saying they are God's creatures. And apart from their skin color, I don't observe any difference anywhere. So that's a great tribute to what or how not to be an, uh, not to uh, contribute to this country, idea of untouchability, I believe. So I, I was just trying to bring them together. Yeah, um, well, that, that's uh, very interesting. I, I hope I got most of that through, through, through the audio. Um, but I, I think one thing that was coming out of that for me was that um, Nivedita, uh, I mean, she, she, she was quite brilliant in the way that she encouraged art. But we have to remember here, and, and this, uh, I think relates strongly to what you say that she is a, a very highly uh, competent educator. And I mentioned her interest in, you know, the, the key uh, uh, educators, uh, Pestalozzi and, and, and Froebel. So, so that's the, where she's coming into. And then um, you also mentioned the, the later artwork by Rabindranath Tagore. Now, I think there's actually a very interesting issue here because um, although the, the earlier um, Bengal school with with uh, Abhinandranath uh, is uh, well very experimental for what it was doing, but relatively conventional compared with what uh, Rabindranath eventually did. Uh, the question that uh, one might ask is: Could Rabindranath have done what he did without Abhinandranath doing what he did previously? And I, I think. Um, um, one might say that Nivedita's importance is that she um, 
actually focuses on the, although her, her, her work is uh, intrinsically political, she actually focuses always on, on, on education, although she makes political statements. And it's through that education that the, uh, that, that, um, that the Bengal school manages to get going and that her, her social work is carried out with people like Abala Bose. But then on the basis of that, suddenly you get this incredible new modernist movement, uh, which at one point is simply a, a one person uh, modern art movement, namely Rabindranath Tagore doing things that he, that no one was expecting him to do at all. And of course then, um, completely change um, art in India. Uh, I hope that an answers some of the points. Thank you. Um, yes, are there any, uh, any more questions or comments? No? Uh, well, I think it's just been a fascinating uh, talk for us where you have shown how prejudice always stems from ignorance. And what all these artists and art critics have done is taken us from prejudice to understanding and to a cosmopolitanism, which uh, is democratic and, uh, and something that needs to be nourished and nurtured. And I think your, your earlier training by George Davy has born well in this lecture. And I, I'll now leave it to Talat and Hugo to conclude. Thank you very much indeed, Murdo. My pleasure. Indeed, um, much gratitude to you, Murdo. It really was a fantastic talk, a real tour de force in terms of these incredibly important individuals who were so critical in their age in terms of the kinds of ideas that they were espousing and the kinds of relationships and intercultural links that they were forming. Um, and of course their ideas um, and their lives and their experiences are still so relevant for us today. Um, so thank you indeed for that. Um, and thank you so much to you Bashabi for chairing so graciously um, and also for your own thoughts um, which are always incredibly enlightening um, on the subject matter today. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and thanks very much to all our audience for attending today. Um, we hope that you've really enjoyed the discussion um, and that you will attend more of our events. Um, and speaking of which, um, just to let you know that our next event um, hosted by the Centre for South Asian Studies is part of our South Asia um, season this month. We had our keynote lecture on Tuesday, uh, but our next event is um, next Thursday at four o'clock. Um, again, it will be on Zoom. Um, and this event is um, the event that the Centre um, sponsored at the Edinburgh International Book Festival this year um, in August. Um, it is a book talk and discussion um, titled Outrages in India. It's the recording of that event because of course many of us were not able to attend it either in person or to view it live online. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that um, our very own Hepzibah Israel will be chairing and introducing that event because she did manage to attend it in person. Um, and this is where the um, author Sonia Falero is in conversation with Fatima Bhutto. Um, so we will be showing that discussion. Um, and also, of course, um, Hepzibar will be fielding a Q&A on the themes that that generates. So that event is next Thursday on the 14th of October at 4 p.m. on Zoom and look forward to seeing you all at that. Uh, but in the meantime, um, everyone, um, hope you have a good evening. Stay well and stay safe and uh, look after yourselves.